You are listening to the Running Channel podcast with me, Andy Badley, my lovely co-host, Sarah Hartley. And then over there with, for some reason, his collar up today, looking at what he thinks is dapper, Rick Kelsey. What I think is dapper. This hey, is Rick. very dapper. I am on it now. You pop I've, that I've, collar. I've, thank you so much. I've had a lot of comments since last week about my uh, wardrobe change. Okay, <laughs> good. And they're all from your lovely wife. <laughs> they are. Giving you the moral support that you need. That's, you know what? Charity starts at home. <laughs> yes, it does. Okay, let's get stuck in. So we're back with another podcast. We're going to be discussing one big topic from the world of running, which this week is key sessions for a faster half marathon. We're then going to delve into some running news before getting to arguably the most important segment of the show, answering your questions. But first, Andy, how's your week been? It's been good. Got out for a little run at the weekend, um, which had the main effect of making me realise just how far away I am from being able to run a marathon. <laughs> Before you give me any abuse about Did it. Did you do the thing where you get to the end of the run and go, oh, and if I was going to run a marathon, that's another 23 miles. Oh, probably more than, yeah, I ran two and a half miles. <laughs> so yeah. Um, it's it all right, was, mate, chunk it. Just I chunk mean, it. Well, this is the very de- definition. I'm starting off with this easy 20 minute run. It's all I could fit in at the weekend. I do feel a little bit pathetic for only having done that because I was so, then I was like, well, that wasn't very fast either. So it was slower, actually, than I would like to run for 26 miles. So, brilliant. 20 minutes. That- I mean, it's a bit pathetic, to be honest with <laughs> you. How far that- did you run at the weekend, Rick? Uh, 26 minutes and Ooh. 44 seconds. Oh, was that oh. your park run time? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I noticed for the first time this week that my watch asked me about my perceived exertion. So oh, at the end of it, where I asked to rate you. I've yeah. never, ever been asked yeah. before what it, was how, how hard I thought I was running compared to how hard... I was actually running. So how hard did you think you were running out of 10? Honestly, I thought my perceived exertion this week, because I knocked two minutes off my nice. time the week before, yeah. wow. was um, nine. <laughs> nine, <out of> 10. <laughs> nine yeah. and a half, probably. Fair enough. Well, I, I, I'd just say bloody good going. Like you're out there back. So like you said, you've done more running than me this weekend. Um, Sarah, how about you? Well, I've realised that me and my dog are on the same level of hating strength and conditioning because this morning I was following along my little video trying to get a bit stronger. My dog came over, stood on my phone and skipped from the (laughs) skipped the video from the second set to the third set without me realising. And it it went on to the same um, move, whatever you call it. Yeah, yeah. So did you so did you just blindly follow along yeah just like a <laughs> like a newsreader reading their auto cue no matter what gets put on it and then i got to the end and he'd skipped it so it was the same move but it was one where you do one on the right leg one on the left leg and it had just suddenly skipped and went into the next Brilliant. like exercise and i was like oh maybe maybe they just missed it well, and then i skipped back and was like oh no there was a whole second set which well, i'm not gonna do <laughs> well actually let's give everyone a little update because i think in last week's podcast you were quite smugly saying you, you did a body weight thing in order to not have any <laughs> delayed onset muscle soreness and therefore you're feeling great but mm-hmm. this was you'd literally just done it yeah a few days later than that th- that last week i spoke to you about it again how are you feeling yeah 20 minute body weight exercise it took me four days until sitting down wasn't painful <laughs> <laughs> there are you know i i love exercise i think it's great but I think when you're in pain sitting down to go to the toilet it's a bit far yeah I I, I would agree (laughs) we're both experiencing the same thing I'm lifting in the gym again for the first time and by lifting I mean I I suppose the weights like actual Olympic (laughs) bar weights lifting I know I feel (laughs) I said that I never thought would come out of Andy's mouth I used to lift quite heavy weights in the gym really yeah I I know it's it's almost impossible to believe yeah he used to get a can of baked beans from the top shelf of the cupboard (laughs) and be able to lift it down (sighs) yeah brilliant I I, I think um, (laughs) a big part of having to run fast is you have to have some amount of explosive power I'm definitely not a strength athlete but it's incredible as well how you can be like run a pb and then go to something else where you're maybe not you like a lot of my problems are i don't use my glutes or like the big muscles in my legs isn't that did you forget the names did you forget the names of all the muscles in your legs there is something technical where it's like the the big muscles are you talking about the anterior chain or the no the 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 powerhouse muscles like isn't that like colloquially what it's called i mean i've never thought of my legs as the powerhouses (laughs) (laughs) Basically, so tread carefully. you can start, you can run pretty fast and you can get pretty far, but not yeah. necessarily engaging the right kind of muscles. So when I've noticed getting faster, it's because I'm engaging my glutes or actually using the correct muscles. So that's why yeah. I'm trying to grow them a little bit, but it just hurts. Yeah, well, it's it's the injuries take the point of the path of least resistance. So they'll, they'll it might not always be, uh, you might not always feel the pain where you're expecting it because if you have weak glutes you might get pain at the knee for example yeah um so it's uh, a good 
things to think about. Both of us are trying to kind of rebuild ourselves. I'm trying to get back up to the point where I could even consider this marathon. You're trying to improve yourself to be even more injury resistant, but then ultimately faster. Yeah, because I keep seeing people who are going for these really fast times that I'm aspiring to, you know, like sub 90 minute halves or mm. sub 20 minute 5Ks. But I think the closer you get to your limit, the more you're dabbling with or you're pushing yourself to an extreme and injuries might happen because you are pushing those limits. Yeah, and weirdly, actually, for me, the faster that I run, if it's a short period of time, the more resilient I am because the, the ground contact times are faster, my biomechanics are more efficient. But then the, the slower and longer I run, the, the more inefficient I am and the more I'll start to get pain. And in particular, um, people at the end of races, you'll see that they're sitting in their hips. So it looks like they're kind of sitting down so they don't, don't have that nice like tall hip position. Someone said it last week as well of um, at the start of the race, you can't really hear the footsteps because mm. everyone's so light off the ground. Yeah. And then at the end of the race, you just hear this like, of like yeah. everyone uh, yeah. slumping a, to yeah, the finish you can line. You hear how long those ground contacts are. As, and, yeah. and so that's when, when you run into trouble. But you mentioned a target of running maybe a sub 90 minute half marathon in the future. Mm. Uh, a little while ago now, you guys, the running channel sent me out to try to record a video about how to run a sub 90 minute half marathon whilst also running a sub 90 minute half marathon and not like an easy road one either it was quite traily wasn't it <laughs> yes it was very traily and that's the the most spent i've ever been at the end of uh, of a long race at least uh, but we I got it done i remember you running off with your gopro and like a little script tucked down your shorts yeah. being like this is a terrible idea because <laughs> it was your idea as well it was my idea and then we ended up yeah at the new forest um the new forest half marathon which was very hilly rutted fields all Beautiful, of that sort of stuff though. yeah it was gorgeous Beautiful fields uh, yeah, see, I, yeah. that was my problem is I was stopping to look at the fields, Rick. <laughs> um, I was just taking so it all in. So distracted, no, Andy, run um, a 90 minute half. <laughs> but that brings us on to our topic for today, doesn't it? We're ultimately, we're talking about uh, sessions or, or just particular ways that you could run a faster half marathon. So. Yeah, half marathon is one of those tricky distances where I actually think it, in some ways, it's harder than a marathon to train for because it isn't so talked about. So what for you, in terms of structuring a training week, are the key sessions to hit when you're training for a faster half? It's not wildly different to the advice that I'd give for 5k, 10k or the marathon, I suppose. <laughs> um, consistency is key. So no one workout is going to fundamentally change your ability to run a fast half marathon, but ultimately structuring your week so that you have got a long run. And if you're building up to your first ever half marathon, then you might not need to actually run a half marathon in training. Yep. But if you're trying to run your fastest ever half marathon, then you'll probably regularly run half marathons as your long run, that kind of distance. Even though I was only training for 1500 meters, so I was running for three or four minutes, my long run on a Sunday every weekend was at least a half marathon. Um, I think as well with when you are running the full distance, like with if you're training for 5k or 10k, you can run that distance, but then break it up, do a little mm. bit of chunking. Are you going to do go out for a half marathon on a Sunday and actually break it up? So you've got 5k warm up and cool down and then three lots of 2k at yeah. 246. Five do lots of 2k yeah. at half marathon pace with like some recoveries you can you can really play around with that long run and make it a lot more interesting than sometimes when you're marathon training and it's just 30k at run as yeah. you feel yeah just mixing it up and then mixing it up throughout the rest of the week as well so you can break that long run up but also you need to have probably a recovery run then maybe an interval session in there as well and the key i think that the, well the key i say it at any distance particularly for the half marathon distance is your threshold runs so like getting the most bang for your buck there and then having that differentiation in training so you've got lots of different paces that you'd hit throughout the week um some of them aimed at time on your feet but a lot of them aimed at making half marathon pace feel a bit easier so then interval sessions as well what specific interval sessions for you jump out as helping with to get a little bit faster yeah so people might need to build up to these depending on what stage you're at but if you are going to try and run a faster half marathon so that would assume that you've already run one before then these kind of distances are very achievable in an interval session things like five lots of 2k you actually mentioned splitting your long run up into five lots of 2k but going mm -hmm. onto the track or or just somewhere where you can use your watch to measure the distance or you know it's it's 2k roughly um, five times 2k but alternate the pace um, and this again is to make half marathon pace feel easy so uh, you do the first third and fifth of the five at 10k pace and then the other two at half marathon pace and then take something like three minutes recovery in between where you keep moving you keep jogging in that recovery um, and then and other ones that are you could throw in there most of these are aimed at just keeping interesting right so you don't just repeat the same intervals mm. they broadly try to do the same sort of thing uh, so you could do two sets of a 3k effort at half marathon pace 
and then five 800 meter efforts where you're alternating pace of those 800s, so between 5K and 10K pace. So again, this this workout gives you 5K, 10K, and half marathon pace. And in this case, the half marathon pace is the slowest of the whole workout. So again, you're working at and beyond your race pace so that hopefully that race pace starts to become a bit more comfortable. Yeah, I do think that for me, when, when I was training for my first half marathon, that was something that I definitely neglected. I was working all the way up to half marathon pace, never yeah. faster than that. And then so on the day, that pace was still really daunting. Yeah. Whereas now, because I, I'm constantly training at 5k and 10k paces as well actually when I then drop down to my half marathon pace it feels like okay this is still this is still a stretch but I know yeah. what faster than this feels like which mentally is so nice yeah the psychology of it's so important like we were I was joking at the beginning of the podcast about running 20 minutes and going oh my gosh how am I going to run a marathon at that pace mm. but that would help that would be how I would feel throughout that training block if I only ever ran at marathon pace or slower or in the case of half marathon, you only ever ran half marathon pace or more slowly. Yeah. How do you ever get the confidence that your that that pace is within your, you know, your it's not your max pace? Mm. Whereas if, if that's the fastest you ever run, it will feel like your max pace. And then if you set off the first two, three mile, two or three miles of that half marathon is going to feel brutal because you're like, I'm on my red light. This is as fast as I've run in the last three months of training. So you need to give yourself some headroom, basically. Yeah, that's why I think some people want really fast results, but actually why these training plans are so long is one to allow your body to kind of adapt to what yeah. you're doing but also to let your mind kind of to let it sink into the fact that can I do this goal race pace yes yeah. I can I've done faster than this it feels comfortable yeah. and that's why I like whenever I'm in a race I always always use the mantra run the mile you're in or run the kilometer yes. you're in if that if that's your preferred metric but the reason for that is your mind is constantly going to be going oh, you're not going to be able to do this in 5K time or like, yeah. oh, you, you won't be able to hold this. But if, you, if it actually feels comfortable in the moment, that's all that you need to worry about. Yeah, and the vice, like I very rarely ran a race where I didn't feel more tired than I wanted to earlier than I was comfortable feeling that tired. <laughs> yeah. So right at the beginning of it, whether that's the first lap of 1500 meters or, you know, the first kilometer of a 5K race or the first quarter of a 10K, it didn't matter. I was still like, oh, this is faster than I want to run right now. And I've got to do this for another four minutes or 30 minutes or whatever it might be. Yeah. That's normal too. So regardless of even when you've psychologically trained faster than race pace, still just accept that it's normal to not want to work as hard as you need to work in the early stages when you actually do the race. Yeah, you've got to, you've got to just battle against yourself <laughs> and yeah. then enjoy the last quarter, which is so much easier said than done. Yeah, you're your own worst enemy. I think I remember talking to Steve Ovet before one of the you know Olympic races that I, that I ran in and, and he said oh you know 10 of the guys that are on that start line have already lost because they don't think they can win um really? regardless of you know could have all done the same training um I'm paraphrasing definitely um, <laughs> but, but but broadly that was what I took away from it he was like don't don't talk yourself out of it mm. um, if I think it is so true though I wonder how many people had the speed in them but didn't have the the mind because like you talk yeah. about when you look at like elite elites you think about oh well they train so much but they're training so many different things it's just as much physical as it is mental when you're trying to break a pb or win a race or qualify for something yeah and, and but like i was fortunate being really old that there wasn't there wasn't <laughs> that much kind of social media commentary on what i was doing mm. um so now there's, there's the doubt that that casts because you can i couldn't see what all my competitors were doing in training but the the pros that are running now can because people post their training and there's there's people doing you know, documentaries about stuff. So you sort of be like, oh, should I be doing that? And the answer is no, you should be doing what, what is right for you based on the last six months of your training. But seeing one little snap, snapshot into how someone else is training can always make you think, oh, sh should I be doing that? Should I have done that as part of my preparation? And then throw into the mix things like, like super shoes. I've spoken to a lot of athletes in the last two or three years where they, they're really worried whether they've picked the right shoe mm -hmm. and then whether that shoe's going to, there are going to be a responder to that particular super shoe the particular brand the way the plate works all that stuff actually that's a good point in terms of half marathon would you say what would you say are the benefits of using a carbon plated shoe as opposed to kind of what you're training in would you say it's the same as a marathon is it going to make a huge difference yeah i mean the shoes have made a difference across the whole range there's some some data coming out now about how shoes impact kind of normal people as opposed to the elites because most of the stuff about four percent or whatever it might be improved running, running economy comes from the elite end where people can test people to their max in the lab and so on. And I think there's more variation in the, in the kind of 
main population of runners that generally there'll be a positive effect of, of carbon player choose. Uh, but yeah, if you don't have the mechanics to, to run in a particular pair in that you might get injured because they're not very stable, um, or you potentially wear one brand that th just doesn't suit your gait, then they might have less of an impact. So it's not open and shut, but but broadly the summary is still like they'll make you faster. So if you can run in them and not get injured, then they'll make you faster. I'm scared of them. Uh, I I wouldn't run a half marathon in them. Is not not with See, your yeah. injury history. No. Right? Like that's the thing. No, I, I just I just worry too much that they'd cause an injury or something would happen while yeah. I was running in them. So I just kind of play it safe. I'll I'll lose the four percent. I yeah. think that is the factor to think about as well, especially the longer you get. You know, for five k, ten k, you you might not be racing that much over an hour. So in terms of testing out the yeah. shoe, you've got less to play with. But yeah, I do think the longer the race, the more that you need to be comfortable training in it and using it for that race. And you don't, it's it's not worth risking it. But injury. I suppose the, the length with a half marathon compared to a marathon, because if you're doing a marathon, you get yourself up to 20 miles in training on the long runs, you know, yeah. just in a couple of weeks before. But for a half marathon, you're more likely to train going the full distance of the half. Yeah. So yeah. you're training at pace on what you might be doing. So it is actually, it's a different regime to how the training would go compared to a marathon, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, and I think it just depends on the time on your feet. So the, 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 I would, for me, the, the longer you're out there running, then the more pronounced the changes in your mechanics are likely to be. Because the, the, yeah, the, the closer to your max that you go and the longer that you do that. So I, I could probably maintain my running form pretty well over 10K. Whereas to take that into a half marathon, you start to just get so much more tired um, and it's a different kind of tire, different energy systems, all of that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, just being more confident in your, and that's where the body weight exercises come in. That's where getting to the gym comes in. Uh, those are all ways to kind of try to make yourself a little bit more bulletproof in, in those later stages of the race or just doing workouts that simulate the tiredness that you're going to feel and then running in the shoes that are slightly less supportive at that point to see if you can handle it. That is the nice thing about half marathon though, is that you probably will run one in training. So at least on the day, you know you can cover the distance. Yeah. It's just the doubt is the speed. Yeah, and we're talking <laughs> about trying to run your fastest one here. Like the, the yeah. I guess to finish off, we briefly touched on threshold running. I think they're, they're very important here. Doing a threshold run every week or every two weeks and going up to around eight miles is probably all you need to do in, in that context. Um, and you can just try and vary that. You could run at your threshold. You could run eight miles where you're breaking up two, 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 and two, where you're trying to get a little bit quicker every every two miles so it's a progressive threshold run or just take a one hour run at tempo or threshold and just do the first 30 minutes slightly easier and then really push on in that second 30 minutes nice well if anyone has any questions on how to run a faster half marathon please do send them in to podcast at the running channel.com and we can answer them in a future episode you are listening to the running channel podcast up next we've got the news so it's almost question time which is my favorite bit answering your questions but before that, we're going to talk about some news stories that Sarah and I found interesting. So first up, Sarah, what have you got for us? I've got LSD. What? <laughs> what? what? Hang on, isn't, isn't that uh, a running acronym? And, yeah, acronym? long, slow oh, long. distance. Oh. No, this time we're talking about the drug. <laughs> right. So okay. um, a few weeks ago, it was the LA Marathon and Diplo has just announced. Do you know, do you know who that is, Andy? Oh, yeah. I'm, I, I really love Diplo. They're a wonderful band. <laughs> 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 I like how you said there as well. Um, yes, Diplo. I've actually seen um, Diplo by accident. I came out of a tube station in Shoreditch and they were just there. It's yeah. very cool. Um, yes, Diplo ran the LA Marathon. He wanted to be... Are we going to tell people who Diplo actually is? A DJ. Okay, well, I'm assuming... Oh, sorry. Are you assuming that anyone, everyone knows, right? Anyone who <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't assume. Anyone... From Angie's generation. <laughs> it's a DJ, which means disc jockey. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. Not jacket. Yeah, excellent. My dad honestly wore a DJ to work every single day. So until I was like 10, I thought a DJ was a dinner jacket. He did play in an orchestra, right? It he wasn't... did play in an orchestra, oh, well, yeah. Uh, your dad wore a DJ to work yeah. every single day? He played in an orchestra. So like my dad going, I had such a warped view of Just what work was. tuxedo every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> by dad in his Imagine little dj cleaning shoes. bills must have been a fortune yeah, yeah. So no he, he just your he, mind goes he just oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no he didn't wash it a lot and his shirt did turn yellow so. <laughs> okay sorry the uh, the dj the dj diplo yes um ran la marathon and has revealed on instagram that he ran it on lsd that doesn't sound like your classic performance-enhancing drug, does it? No. Well, so 
I, I, I might need a, that to get me, I was to get doing me through a bit my of, marathon uh, later this year. Well, so you see, I was doing a bit of research into LSD. Yeah. I'm just going to get my phone. When you say research, like trying it? Yeah, just at the weekend. Just no. Um, oh, I actually wanted okay. to do this as a quiz. Andy, what is a kind of colloquial term or nickname for LSD? Just any other name that someone's called it. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Acid? Or is that different? Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> He's all over I it. I just love... <laughs> I was just looking that? on this web- on website and it's called like Smiley Stars. There's, I just okay. can't believe how many names. Yeah. Anyway, but um, you might feel energised, excited, giggly or confused, but it makes you kind of really, really aware of everything. So actually some people have said that it actually slowed them down and they were running a lot slower. Hyper aware of the pain they, that they're in. Yeah, yeah. No, because they were just taking everything Looking in. Looking around. Like, yeah. Were, Greeting everybody individually. Yeah, the staring crowd was probably, yeah, staring at those fields, yeah. taking too much in. But yeah, he, so he ran it on LSD. He wanted to be, beat Oprah Winfrey's time from 1994. Was she on LSD? No. <laughs> no. Oh, it's not, she, he wasn't beating her time on LSD. No. Her time. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't just a competition there a Guinness among, World Record? amongst celebrities yeah. of who can run the fastest. I don't think we'd get that ratified, would we? If we no, got in touch with Guinness. Probably not. Um, but yeah, she ran it back in 1994 in four hours and 29 minutes. So I think that was his time that he yeah. wanted to beat regardless of the LSD. Yeah. Um, but he managed to run three hours, 55 minutes and 16 seconds. Three hours fifty-five on yeah. LSD. Mm. That's, that sounds pretty good to me. I mean, it's annoying is he a as someone that trains a lot. That <laughs> is he a runner though? Well, apparently he'd never run further than eleven miles oh, pri- they all, they all prior say to this. the race. Yeah. But apparently, I was reading on the article there have been some half marathons back in his history of running. So okay, well he must have run further than eleven miles then. Yes, Andy, he must have. Well, I have deduced <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. Welcome to Maths Corner with Andy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, there we go. What do we think? I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not going to be the one that, that puts my body on the line in terms of trying it, I don't think. No, I think that's too much for me. And I don't think that's a, that's, I would, you know, want a sub two hour marathon if I was going to be on LSD. I think. So, so you think, okay, that, that's a, that's a big leap. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I just yeah. think the risk that you're taking, you might as well come away with a world record. But yeah. Andy, what's, what's your world record? Mine's drug related too, a very Is different it? kind of drug. Um, it's EPO related. So um, that's not quite as fun as LSD, is it? Th- well, I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> is that you speaking from experience, Sarah? No, I've got no idea. <laughs> I couldn't have. Just, I wouldn't have even known a name. I mean, the, if anyone has seen the um, documentary, which I've now forgotten what it's called, um, where they there's it starts with a cyclist and then he uncovers the whole Russian doping conspiracy. Icarus. Icarus. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, the sort of he's tempted at the start to see how much of an effect the EPO would have on him. Um, mm. There is a small part of me that would just like to know. Like I've complained for a long time about the people I was competing against that I thought were cheating. So I'd sort of would love to know what it would do. I'm, I'm never going to do it. But um, but this is related to my news story. So Zane Robertson is a New Zealand, uh, a distance runner from New Zealand. He was a medalist in the Commonwealth Games. Um, he holds various New Zealand records for long distance races. Um, and so sort of 5k up to the marathon were his, his competitive distances he he's, he's pretty famous in running circles for him and his, his brother uh, jake moved out to kenya when they were 17 they're in their early to mid 30s now and they just moved everything there and they had like a pretty tough life in new zealand from my understanding of it and they were kind of escaping that to to try and see whether they could make it as some of the best in the world um but last week it, it came out in the news that the zane had tested positive this time last year or may 2022 at the manchester 10k um, tested positive for EPO, um, but it's taken until now to come through the courts and all that sort of stuff. Um, he'd made various claims um, that have been disproven now. He tried to kind of cover his tracks by claiming that actually, it's a bonkers claim that he went into a, a, a doctor's in Kenya to receive the COVID vaccine and mm. they accidentally gave him EPO. Wow. And he provided various paperwork to try and prove this, but that's been all shown. Uh, and he's admitted that he falsified those things. So it's, um, it's this this crazy story he's had an eight-year ban now and he's 33 i think so i mean so he that's said that's kind of game over him yeah. Out. yeah uh but the reason i mention this isn't just it's someone else cheating um i listened to a podcast the first um interview that he did after the news came out and it was a i am as cynical as they come i hate cheating i it ruined various parts of my career and people are, people i raced against and so on but you do forget that the athletes are people and mm-hmm. and like i listened to this podcast to him and he's he was broken by this whole process and there's various stuff which i would 
say I didn't think he was telling the truth on. Like he said, he'd only taken it once and just happened to get caught that one time, mm. which is the classic kind of doper's excuse. But actually, regardless, just listening to him, like it was a brutal listen to hear someone so kind of, you know, the thing that they clearly love, move to the other side of the world to a whole new country, new continent to pursue. Um, it must be so hard as well. Obviously, if if everyone in the world just agreed to not dope, then well, they kind of have. That's that's that's, that's no, the rule. That's the in, rules. Yeah. But as in, like, if every if you knew every single person standing on that start line had categorically not done it, yeah. then then it would be like these villains that are coming in and crossing it, which is what is happening. But also, if you look at it from the other side, if you're lining up knowing that you've done everything in your power and you deserve to be on that start line but you've got the doubt of everyone else who's around yeah. you. It's, I, I can see it from the perspective of, oh, well, if everyone else is doing it, then I need to up my level game. up. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, he talked about his why and that was interesting. And I kind of, I get it, but I would never, have, it never even crossed my mind. I, I experienced broadly all the same things, maybe not to the same extent. I don't know. I can't put myself in someone else's head. But the things that he described, you know, depression, uh, injury, feeling like you're doing everything in your power and not understanding how you can't compete. Um, what I would love to hear though, and I doubt, well, maybe we will hear it one day is someone who has all the glory of winning, mm. who's, you know, doped and then has got their gold medal or whatever. Yeah. I'd love to hear someone talk openly about when the rest of the world didn't know, Yeah, did it, did it feel good? Yeah. Or did you was look there... yourself in the mirror at night? Yeah. Yeah. Or at any point during the day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that would, you'd only feel guilty about it at night for some reason. But yeah, it just, um, I read Tyler Hamilton's book and that was the first book that made me feel some kind of compassion really and like realise that they're, they're humans as well. But, but, but not, yeah, it's, not it's much sad... compassion. Well, I, I, yeah, I'm obviously not advocating cheating. I think it's, it's, it's bad. That's my summary. As well. <laughs> cheating is bad. <laughs> yeah. Interesting um, to actually hear people that, because quite often you just yeah. see the news headline and then yeah. you... And then you leave it. Yeah, you forget there's a family and, and, and all that sort of stuff behind it. So you're listening to the Running Channel podcast. Up next, we have got your questions. So every episode, I select a couple of questions for Andy and Sarah to answer. And if you want to suggest a question for next time, email us podcast at the running channel dot com. First up, Oliver. And he says this one's for Andy. I'm guessing you did start running at a younger age and I'd be interested to know what other sports you did growing up and if you think it would be beneficial to focus on one particular sport early on, e.g. running, or better, carry on with another sport alongside it, such as football. This is all about, essentially, the time when we think, actually, I'm really good at something. Should I just focus on that now? Not just for injury, but so you improve quicker at that one sport and leave all the others behind. Mm. Yeah, and amazingly, Rick got through that really long question very well. What well a mate. Yeah, I paraphrased quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's difficult. <laughs> Lots of long words. Um, thanks for the question, Oliver. I started running when I was 10, 11, year six at primary school Yeah. Um, and went on various cross-country teams and stuff. Um, but if I'm speaking to schools now, I'll make sure that they know that when I went to secondary school, um, year seven and eight, so any international listeners that would have been 11 or 12 um i was not even in the top 10 best runners in my year at my own school so um i just enjoyed it and i, and I was quite good like yeah i come 10 or 15th out of my year of 180 kids at my school uh but i wasn't the best but i just kept showing up um and other people found other sports um but at the same time as that i was also doing football tennis Swimming, I'd swum from a really young age as well. And I probably only carried swimming on until about 12 or 13 because actually I quite quickly wasn't, for whatever reason, just wasn't as good at that. I wasn't as talented at swimming as, as some of the other stuff. Um, and then even within running, right the way up until about 15, I was still doing 800 meters, long jump, um, the four by four, like whatever I was being asked to do really because I just enjoyed being part of that environment. I did a bit of sailing, not that that's particularly cardiovascularly <laughs> tasking, ta <laughs> taxing. Um, <laughs> Everyone's laughing. What's wrong with that? It's a sport. It's just I not, just we didn't expect you to say that. I huh. just imagine you sailing a boat. <laughs> and what are you imagining? Like you in a little hat. <laughs> <laughs> with a GB cap on. Ahoy there. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was me. Um, but I, I ended up kind of, uh, I played football until I was about 14. And then at that point, the physicality of the, fo of the, of the football did mean that, um, and I was having to choose 
I couldn't go to all of the different training sessions for running and to the training sessions for, for football. This um, sounds like a film. <laughs> <laughs> what will he choose? Not, not a very interesting one. Um, <laughs> but, but I would say that the like mid-teens in terms of focusing on one sport, um, I think there are some sports that I can't really speak from fast experience, but if you wanted to be amazing at tennis or golf and so on, just the amount of time that you've got to put into it and the early hours for swimming and things like that. Mm. But the more that you can do, um, I think it gives you a more rounded experience. Then you can focus on what you enjoy because if I hadn't enjoyed running, then I wouldn't have been able to be good at it. And, and throughout my career, the, the times that I ran the best was when I was enjoying it the most. Yeah. So it's kind of more mid-teen kind of years where you've got to make that choice and move on. But before that, you know, give anything a go. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, next question is from Emily, who emailed in asking, how much can you really increase your speed through doing the right training, such as working in intervals and speed work more generally? So, you know, how can we get a lot faster through doing the right speed work? I mean, just anecdotally, this for me is what made the biggest difference in my running. When yeah. I first started, I went from kind of sub 30 minute 5k down to sub 25 minute 5k. That took me almost two years. Yeah. And then within a year, I went from a probably like a 24 minute 5k to a 22 minute 5k. Mm -hmm. Show off. <laughs> oh, I was just saying anecdotally. <laughs> oh yeah, if you say anecdotally, it's not showing off, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Um, I just can't win with something. But no, it's the, the, you fundamentally changed the way you constructed your training week and then kind of did the right stuff. Yeah. And then I had an immediate impact. And I stopped just leaving the house and going, today I'm going to run a 26 minute 5K. And then the next day, yeah, I'm going, do it every single today time. I'm going yeah. to run a 25 minute 5K. Yeah. I think if you don't do any intervals at all, putting intervals in there will have a massive impact. If you're already doing some different types of interval training, then changing them to be, I suppose, the right one will make a difference, but it's not going to have this huge sea change uh, mm. effect. But I'd say there's two different answers. One is, um, can you increase your speed, like your natural speed through intervals and, and that sort of stuff? And the other one is how much faster will intervals make you, which is different. Because I was, for example, naturally quite fast and I never... Flex. Yeah, there we go, showing, showing <laughs> off. Um, so throughout my career, I wasn't working on being faster over 100 meters and that my, my top speed. Yeah, I just couldn't keep up because I wasn't fit enough. So the interval training that I was working on was still what you'd consider speed work, but it wasn't to make me faster at that top end, like my all-out sprint. It was to allow me to maintain a hard effort for much longer. So mm -hmm. that's what I mean by by that. But yeah, if you, if you if you are one-paced and you're coming out running, like Sarah said, you just would go out and like, well, I want to run a faster 5K. I'll just run 5K as hard as I can. Doing it, doing something that's only like 30 seconds long or a minute long as an interval will have a massive impact on how fast you can turn your legs over, which in turn will make you faster. There's a question. With your first point, does everyone have a limit that they just can't push past? Or do you think with the right training, everyone could achieve, not like world record times, but everyone could achieve a fast time? No, the, I, everyone has a some kind of limit genetically. Like I, I don't think I could ever run a, could have ever run a 2.0 something marathon, um, mm. e even though I was running at a very high level. So I think you're definitely predisposed to be best at a certain range of events yeah. in terms of like at the top end like as in what you run flat out for your pbs it's, but like, I wouldn't... it's that phrase isn't it has he got it in him has he got has she got yeah. it in her yeah yeah have well, you got I, it in you I, I don't know but ellie kuchogi would say <laughs> no human is limited um well, so yeah it's... this is what's interesting is that i think i think it's funny when you're perpetually working towards pbs i always have in the back of my mind well i don't want to make too big a leap or i'm going to be i'm only 25 i don't want to be 27 and have nowhere else to go because i've hit <laughs> yeah. my i don't think i'm gonna get there you're gonna be chasing your own tail for the rest of your life yeah i yeah. I, I basically i want to savor the moment of being able to go right that, yeah that's yeah. it well it's like doing that's a P, where I can yeah get to. so your pb so you just up it by a, a couple of bit. seconds it's, uh, so it's incremental gains yeah instead of big gains because then the next time you're like oh well i'm never gonna you know go sub 20 now so cynics will be watching the running channel going oh this is this is nonsense sarah could have run a lot faster than that if she improves her pb by one second at a time <laughs> no, i promise you i couldn't <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I really it's like, like, look at my face at the end of any of the races yeah. i've done i'm i'm trying i promise well it's like the pole vault world record they only ever put it up one centimeter at a time because they can cash in on that and get a paycheck every time they break the world record but if they were uh, capable of breaking it by 20 centimeters they could have just done that but then why not when they can get 20 paydays i always thought pole vault was so easy <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. Stay tuned. <laughs> Have you ever done it? 
Yeah, yeah. I did. Oh, actually, I did no, it. more. Have you yeah. ever watched when it goes wrong? Yeah, yeah. But I can imagine it can cause quite a few problems. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not for you, though, because it's easy, right? No. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's such a big... People make a big deal about it. It's like the steeplechase. Email in to <laughs> podcast. Over the hurdles, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Email in to podcast at therunningchannel.com if you want to see Rick take on the pole vault at the same time as we get Andy to do that 10K buggy world record. <laughs> And I'll just watch from the sidelines, not pushing myself. <laughs> Incredible. I mean, Rick, no, ch no change there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I mean, Rick, that's literally the most ridiculous thing that we've said so far on the podcast, I think. So we should leave it there. You've been listening to the Running Channel podcast. Thank you very much. Please do us a small favor and leave us a review or a rating. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.